Hi, this is Mike Hendrickson from Strata Conference in London. I'm here with Duncan Ross from Teradata. Duncan, how are you doing? I'm very good, thank you. So you just had a talk, and it was about uh, using data for evil? Absolutely. Who wants to use data for evil? Well, unfortunately, far, too, yeah. <laughs> far too many people. But in reality, the, the idea was to pitch a talk about how to take an ethical stance on data analysis without becoming very moral and very uh, holier than thou. And so we came up with the idea of, of phrasing it in the other way. You know, how would you use data for evil? And our hypothesis is that actually it's very easy to use data for evil, not through deliberately doing evil, but just by failing to do good and failing to think about the consequences of your action. So a little bit like our NSA um, that's uh, not asking for... Their name came up. I mean, there's a great example of an organization that's clearly set up to do good, but what they've been doing is um, questionable. You know, people take different views on whether they should have been doing it, but it's certainly not as clear-cut as they probably thought it was. Yeah. And a lot of people who are even working for you know, more commercial organizations will find themselves in the same position. They'll be, do be doing analyses because they enjoy the analysis and because it's cool and exciting and they have the ability to do it without necessarily thinking about what the impact of that analysis could be. And so we want people to think about that and actually bring that onto their radar. So when someone is looking through a big pile of data and they discover something that could be questionable, did they just look the other way? Or well, it's not, it, you know. no, it's, it's not necessarily that, but if you look at um, some of the things you can do with data. So the data that uh, the NSA have been um, uh, blamed for using, for example, which they call metadata, uh, a telco would probably call call detail records. Mm -hmm. okay, and these record the A and B numbers, who calls whom, when, for how long. From that data, you could very easily do analysis around, for example, when people fall in love, when they move in together. Now, you could do that. The question is, should you do that? Right. right. And what we were saying was basically you ought to think about the should you as well as the can you. So the can you to should you is a continuum just like creepy to cool? <laughs> well, creepy to cool is a good way of putting it. But um, it's, often it's not clear cut because there is also a difference between the analysis. I can find things out, but if they're not put into action, then no one has, there's no differential impact. Um, and in the end of the day, most analysts aren't actually in the business of doing the stuff. But if they think about it, then they can help make better business decisions. And why does that make sense from a commercial perspective? Because you might say, well, actually, I could make money out of detecting when people are moving in together, for example. Uh, and, but it does come back to that creepiness factor. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. In Europe, we have uh, quite a rigorous data protection legislation based around EU 9546 EC, the European Data Directive. But even under that, there is a big difference between what the law allows you to do and what customers would feel happy with you doing. And companies can suffer far more from reputational damage than they probably can from legal damage. So actually having your analysts thinking about the, the right thing to do right. is a very sensible bus business position to take. Yep. So from a business perspective, you guys have been working with some established enterprise companies for quite a while. And where do you see those people transitioning in the future with this new data-oriented world? Well, the good news from our perspective is that a lot of these companies have already been thinking a lot about data, but the data they've been thinking about is their traditional data sets. So the data, data that was around accountancy and finance, moving into the data around transactions. Now we're moving into a world where data is also about the interactions with customers. And not all of that data is internal, so there's this shift from purely internal data, which is great because you control it, you understand it to this external data where you don't control it. You aren't in control of the flows, you aren't in control of the formats. And incorporating those into your business processes is tricky. We also see a lot of the big, um, big organizations struggling very hard with the ability to innovate. And all of the time we have the new companies coming up and threatening their business models, threatening to cannibalize or to, um, to take over and disrupt business. At the same time, the big organizations are looking to data as a way of innovating a way of changing their behavior fundamentally. Uh, and that's a really exciting place to be, and data's part of that. So you help migrate those companies from that old world to this new? Well, yes and no. So there is an element of, of migration. There is an element of doing things differently. But there's also an element of actually doing the core business really well. Um, uh, as Mark Baston said in his talk today, you know, it isn't all about disruption. It's not all about destroying the old. It's actually about building upon what's already there to get the best of both worlds. So Duncan, if there's a lot of these enterprise companies that are making a transition to a new data world, do we need some sort of platform or architecture for these companies to make that transition happen smoother? We absolutely do, and we have a concept we call the unified data architecture. 
And what that allows these organizations to do is we're in the same infrastructure, have both the uh, enterprise data warehouse, which takes care of the traditional, uh, well-established enterprise hardened analyses, a discovery platform for um, finding the new things that are going to make the difference going forward, but also the big data technologies like Hadoop, where you can store vast amounts of data at a very low cost rate, but with an additional complexity of processing. By putting all those things together, we allow a seamless transition between that discovery end and the productionization. Because if you can't productionize your insights, actually they're not very valuable to you. So does a company ever get to a point to where they throw that one, one part away? The, the want to say legacy part, but the part that's the maybe data warehouse? No, because actually the data warehouse is still doing some very important things. You know, if you think to the, some of the terminology around here, you know, ACID compliant databases, if you're doing your financial reports at the year end, uh, the SEC is not going to be very happy if you say, well, I can give you the results now, but they're not going to be accurate, or I can give them to you in three months' time, and they'll be accurate, but three months late. You've got to be able to do some things in a very efficient, very well understood way. Other things you're much freer to experiment with. When you're looking for those insights, actually you've got more flexibility, yeah. you can yep. experiment. And so I don't see it as being an either or. I see it as being actually you know, moving Both. from the tyranny of or to the power of and. So the unified data architecture gives you all? Absolutely. And the, one of the key things about it that I really love is that as a user, because I'm an analyst, I'm not a techni technical person, I don't know or care really very much what goes underneath, and I shouldn't. What I want to have is the data I need delivered to me when I need it efficiently and effectively so I can do the analysis and find out the interesting things. And does this work in, in industries that are kind of real-time oriented and retail oriented as well? Absolutely. Like I mean, the, the key here is that uh, it will work from data that's very fresh, very up to the minute, almost real time. I'm always a bit wary about the phrase real time. Oh, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Through to uh, data that is, that is um, less immediate. And actually, one of the challenges is balancing your storage so that you're not storing all the stuff that you only need once every six years in the high cost end, and you're not storing the stuff that you need immediately in the low cost, slow access end. Uh, and you need to have a system that's intelligent enough to know when to move data from one part to the other, when data becomes uh, less time and meat sensitive and it can be moved out to the cheaper storage or more time sensitive and moved up. So how do you do that, that moving? This, I mean, is there some well, algorithm that determines what's high value and what's not? And we're, we're looking at something called fabric computing and the idea of fabric computing is that you actually do some of the processing during the data movement. So actually as, the, as time goes by and, these, uh, and the optimizer understands where data needs to be, not only can it move that data automatically, but it can actually process it during the move. Oh, interesting. So where do you see the U UDA, Unified Data Architecture, going in the future? I do see it moving towards a situation where the optimizer is taking the decisioning about where you need to go to get the data out of the hands of the end user. The end user doesn't need to know or care. The end user is concentrating and focusing on the business question, because that's where the value comes from. You know, no, you know, everything underneath is just storing data. You don't make money as a business just by having the biggest yeah. data store. Yeah. You make it by making the analysis and making the actions based upon that analysis. Okay, so making actions. We have a saying at O'Reilly that we work on stuff that matters. If there was one problem in the world that you could sick data on and have a solution come that helps that problem go away, what would that problem be? I don't know, but I, and to be fair, I'm not in the business of knowing that. Um, so I, I do work as well for an organiz organization called Datakind. Mm -hmm. And Datakind has very much from the start had the idea of saying, we know about data science, we know about data analysis, but we don't know about these problems. Yep. So we want charities to come to data kind and say, this is the problem. Help okay. solve it. Help yep. us solve it. If we were, I think you know, for technologists to go in and say, actually, we understand the problems of the world and we're going to solve them is a very, very arrogant position. And in fact, it hasn't worked out so well in the past either. Yep. Uh, yep. Why would we think it was going to work well in the future? Let's let those problems come to the data. Now, there are lots of things that we're going to be able to do as a byproduct of the data that people are just generating. Um, we see, so we did some recent work in July and we had Oxfam GB looking at world food prices and predicting world food prices. Yes, yeah. We had um, a educational authority here in the UK trying to predict where special educational needs were going to arise. Now they didn't solve the problems entirely, but they actually started addressing those problems and understanding what data was relevant to them. And that's the way I think we should think about this kind of thing. Is what? that datakind.org or how does someone find out more? Datakind.org.uk or datakind.org. There's a US version as well. Okay, for our excellent. US readers. Excellent. Duncan, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you.